Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of February 18th. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, and I will be presiding. Um, we're going to start, as we usually do, uh, before we uh, determine whether we perform or not, we take this opportunity to provide the public an opportunity to speak to us. Um, so in so doing, we will not comment. You get to say your piece on any topic of your choosing. We just ask that you uh, <coughs> keep in mind the decorum of the, of the chamber and uh, be civil. But you're not limited by topic, as I said, but you are limited by time. And we uh, limit the, co the comments to three minutes per person. Um, because I'll have to go home at some point. And the only other thing that I would ask you to do is when I call your name, come up, repeat your name and your address, and then, then your three minutes start there. Um, and also, if you haven't signed up, it's okay. You're not excluded from speaking. You will have an, I'll give folks an opportunity if they, they still feel the, the urge to speak. So first up, we have Hildegard Friedman, please. Friedman, 137 High Street, apartment 130. Oh, we the people, the over 300 million people, did we hear the guns? Did we swallow Aaron Alexis's pills, the mass murder pills? Did we notice the lives ruined, the people murdered, the communities destroyed? by the epidemic of heroin, cocaine, new strains of marijuana laced with pharmaceuticals. Some additions provided by and contributing to the purse strings of those practicing missile launches against America. We the people, are we asleep or are we ready to make this city the most outstanding in the United States? There is a grant. And no matter what you got an email that defines the grant <coughs> a certain way, it can be written for 50-year-olds, it doesn't need to be written for 20-year-olds. The outgoing mayor of Pittsfield, Mayor Bianchi, obtained an anti-gang, anti-terrorism grant, which gets police in the door. We're not talking about the Hoover administration. This isn't a death thing with machine guns. <laughs> I know some people are going to misconstrue. I don't want to inform you which people you know which people. Gets police in the door with a mentor. Gets police in the door with a social worker. In the door to anybody that has any extent of drug history, not indictments. I've had Cindy in the mayor's office forward the information to Mr. Dwight, and Pam has sent it to you people uh, via email. And as late as mid-afternoon today, I was making an endeavor with one of the mayor's assistants, Mayor Matnaco's assistants, to put together an outstanding uh, former attorney, now pastor, who's one of the pivotal points of the beginning of the movement in Pittsfield, uh, Pastor Ralph Howe, who spent his life as a lawyer. I have spoken to police captain of operations, Cartledge, and I will be meeting with him in March. And trying to put him in touch with a grant writer in Pittsfield, but that's not necessarily going to be comfortable. You get this grant, you bring it to the top, and Northampton will be the greatest if you, if you do the right job with the grant. I'm not telling you what is the right job. That's for you to decide, but you will be the greatest city in America. So get ready for a police president, perhaps, the next time around. The nation is on the verge of bankruptcy. The nation is drenched in blood. Unemployable people contribute to the nation's bankruptcy. <laughs> well, Hildegard, hold that thought and we'll, we'll see you again. Yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, Ron Patno, please. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Good evening, my name is Ron Patnod. Uh, I reside at 436 North Blanford Road, Blanford, Massachusetts, and I'm here tonight as the president of the Hampshire Franklin Central Labor Council. I'd like to thank the members of the City Council for taking up and considering this resolution uh, on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and specifically, I believe, against it. Um, while members of the labor community are not against fair trade agreements, we do oppose free trade agreements that have no protections for workers or the environment and which could actually lead to higher prescription drug prices and lawsuits against our own government for having worker protections and environmental protections. We're not alone in our opposition to this agreement as it is written. We're part of a broad coalition including organi um, environmental organizations. We believe if, if a trade uh, agreement doesn't meet the needs of working people, it should not be approved. The Trans-Pacific Partnership was negotiated in secrets, but as components of the agreement come to light, we now know why they were trying to hide it so hard. Um, uh, the the Trans-Pacific Partnership was negotiated by corporations and for corporations at the expense of people, working people, and our democracy. Please don't let anyone tell you the labor movement is opposed to trade agreements. The labor movement is opposed to bad trade agreements, which this most certainly is. Any trade agreement our government supports should advance an economy that creates good jobs in America and that enables regular working people to succeed by working hard to get ahead. The TPP will not do that. The TPP is the latest example of a failed approach to trade starting with NAFTA, which drives down wages and creates special rights for corporations. Passage of the TPP as written will mean lost jobs and lower wages, which is why we will continue to work to defeat it. Trade policy has not worked for working people in our country as a whole. The TPP is an outsourcing deal, not a trade deal. We strongly urge you to support this resolution and oppose the TPP as it is just the latest in a long line of bad trade deals the American people have had pushed upon them by corporate interests. And I thank you very much. Thank you. John Weissman, please. <coughs> Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to address you. My name is John Weissman. I coordinate Jobs with Justice in Western Massachusetts. Jobs with Justice builds coalitions of labor groups, religious groups, student groups, and community organizing groups. And the clock is not, there we go. Okay. And uh, I want to reinforce uh, Ron's message. I want to thank you for taking up a resolution which is part of a strategy of telling the negotiators of the TPP, including the Obama administration, that the people don't want this deal. And cities and towns across the country are being asked to vote in such a resolution. So you become part of a movement by adopting this resolution. Very important that there be a movement like this because we've seen in the past, starting with NAFTA, that the movement has not been strong enough to stop lousy trade deals. And that's a problem in this country, that the movement, and what is this movement we're talking about, that isn't strong enough. <coughs> The heart of that movement is the labor movement. The labor movement has been in decline. The go jobs that we lost under NAFTA and the rest of them, CAFTA and the rest, those jobs were by and large union jobs. And the result was that as productivity skyrockets in this country, wages are flat. And there's a whole lot of other ramifications. We call it wealth and income inequality. That's a direct result of the decision to negotiate these trade deals. Now let's look at who negotiated the trade deals. It's corporate America. So we're not talking about people who don't want to wage class war and want to improve, you know, want a rising sea that rise, lifts all boats. We're talking about a certain select group of people that only want to lift their own yachts. And with that in mind, <coughs> we need to rebuild the other side of the war. They've declared war on us and we're going to have to fight back. So cities and towns are going to be part of that because as electeds, you represent the ordinary people of Northampton. So that's why I want to say on behalf of Jobs with Justice, which is very central to this fight across the country, that we really enjoy the relationship we have with the Northampton City Council and the, and the city of Northampton, where you fostered the right to organize, you fostered living wages, you fostered the Workers' Center. That were, um, so I'm <coughs> thanking you as well as encouraging you all on as leaders of this movement. Thank you very much. Uh, Reed Schimmelfink, please. Thank you. Uh, Reed Schimmelfink, 32 Row Avenue. 
Um, I will try to be brief and focus on just one of the many aspects of the Trans-Pacific Partnership worthy of opposing this incredibly bad idea, and I've written notes to make sure that I'm brief. My focus relates to the reversal of the balance between governments and corporations. Some people believe that local government should not spend its time and energy focusing on interna international trade agreements. To those people, I would say just the opposite. Democracy is at its best and most connected to citizens <coughs> on a local level. This is where we as citizens can speak directly to our elected representatives, both formally like I'm doing here, as well as informally. Our voice is augmented by your actions through initiatives such as what you are considering here tonight bring messages louder and clearer to larger, more distant bodies such as in Boston and Washington. <coughs> if approved, TPP will make profit and the desires of corporations primary and above government authority at all levels of government. Its threat is most vivid on an international level where a corporation would be able to challenge and overturn efforts here in the United States to restrict trade in businesses that use human slavery, have lax food safety standards, or do damage to the environment to maximize profit, to name just a few. However, state and even local governments would be similarly vulnerable to being sued by corporations who believe a government's actions are reducing their profit. For example, and a very small example, it is my understanding that a corporation could make a stand that their business was harmed by a disposable plastic bag or takeout <coughs> container restriction. If this corporation was based in a country covered by this agreement, and the U.S. is also a part of the agreement, the local government's right to enact such a law would be rejected and the law overturned. I encourage you to support this resolution opposing the TPP. Thank you. Thank you. Jasper Lopiansky, please. <coughs> Hi, my name is Jasper Lepiansky. I live at 43 West Street. Um, sorry to deviate from the um, prescribed topic, <coughs> not going to voice an opinion on Trans-Pacific Partnership at a city council meeting. Um, I have nothing to say regarding the agenda. What I would like to inform all of you of is that I have proposed um, having a weather station at the Forbes Library. Um, that is to say, I proposed it at a recent, um, I believe it was yesterday, meeting of the trustees of Forbes. Um, they said it was an interesting idea. We're going to be exploring possibilities. Uh, I hopefully won't have to ask you for money, but it isn't expensive, so I think that's unlikely. The idea would be to have a weather station on the grounds of the Forbes Library that automatically collects data and constantly, every couple of minutes, adds it to the Forbes Library collection, which could be used by Northampton Public Schools, Daily Hampshire Gazette, um, the mayor's office, if they wanted to know whether it's actually the coldest winter on record, because we say every year that it is. Um, and I think it would be interesting for a number of reasons. One, because we don't really have that in Northampton. All the records come from Amherst, where the Daily Hampshire Gazette says they know how many inches of snow we got. Either they measured it themselves or they're getting it from someone else across the river. Um, and also because specifically there's a meteorological term called a heat island, which refers to the cluster of buildings in a city center. The climate is legitimately different on Main Street than it is, say, on Finn Street, or certainly than it was when I lived on Burt's Pit Road. It's freaking cold out there. Um, but I digress. The point is I think it would be a useful resource. Um, I'm going to go through the appropriate channels and hopefully within the next few months we'll, we'll be able to say that we actually have a weather station at Forbes Library and um, I'll keep you informed. Thank you very much. Um, that's all I have signed up. <coughs> yes, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is Ryan Quinn. I live at uh, 496 Elm Street. Uh, I am a, uh, an organizer for United Auto Workers Local 2322, which has uh, 5,000 members in Western Mass, uh, Vermont, and Southern New Hampshire, and also 315 members who live in Northampton. <coughs> I'd like to uh, speak to the, um, 
the resolution uh, on the TPP. Uh, I just want to say <clears throat> how pleased I am to uh, live in a city where that's uh, addressing this and that's uh, looking at making such a resolution. Um, I don't think I can say much more about it that uh, Mr. Weissman or Mr. Patnod haven't already haven't already said. I just want to say, uh, as a resident of Northampton, I support the resolution, and I'm proud that the City Council has taken it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to speak? Carolyn, you're up. Hi, I'm Carolyn Toll Oppenheim. I live at Three Montview Avenue, and. I got here late, I'm sorry, so I'm, I'm afraid I may be saying something that someone else said. Well, it's okay. Okay, well, I, I did what he said. I'm thrilled to be in a city that takes this up, um, and I'm sure I'm dittoing what others said. I see this TPP as a terrible threat to the public sector, <coughs> as NAFTA was, and um, I think these ISDSs are very, very dangerous. That's been said. Already? Um, no, go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. These ISDSs, I'm trying quickly trying to find what it means, but it, these are these uh, investor to state dispute settlement um, uh, entities, that, a private justice system that undermines U.S. sovereignty and democratic control over our economy. The, something like this has already existed in corporate tribunals, and in 1999, this public was much better educated about that and went to Seattle and fought corporate control um, over sovereign governments. And, you know, I see this as a slippery slope towards losing control over our own municipalities, and we're, we're at some point, the corporations have control over our government for financial reasons, and we lose through through privatization. We lose our right to govern our own cities, and I think it's I'm not being super articulate, but this uh, this thing has to be fought, and I'm just very proud the city's taking a stand. I want to register that. Thank you so much. Anyone else? <coughs> yes. Uh, Wes Hardy, 19 Mark Circle. Um, actually not going to agree with everyone else. Um, trade uh, is one of the best ways to prevent violent military conflicts. And it might seem crazy, but hear me out. If you decide that you're going to do sanctions on a country like Iran or, say, <coughs> Russia, right? People inside that country, for example, Sanderson Farms, can't ship their chicken to Russia anymore. So Russia doesn't have enough chicken, right? But there's some guy in Russia who starts making a lot of money with replacement goods, right? There is no incentive to bring the Russians to the table and negotiate because now there's someone making money because of a replacement good. So there, it, it doesn't have the effect you want it to. It, it, you're <coughs> carving out a section of the world. The other thing I would say is that jobs only move if there's a more efficient system in place somewhere else, if the cost of labor is lower. In other words, say 50% of a country is unemployed. Well, if you move a factory there, obviously people are willing to work for less because they'd rather get $3 a day than no dollars a day. Which brings me to my next point, which is going to be on the agenda soon. Having a two-tier rate system it does relate. If we're going to look at our water system and say, okay, well, Coca-Cola is a huge employer, but we're going to make them pay more. These companies, I mean, some people think that they want to make a profit and that's evil, and that's fine. You, you can have that view. I could even acknowledge some companies may do evil. The problem is they are motivated by profit. We know that, right? If you start chopping away at their profit, these people are not idiots. They're not going to not change something. They're not, they might, they could retool and move. They could go to Greenfield, Amherst, but I'm, I'm most concerned with the small businesses. I mean, mainly in downtown, now what we have left is, you know, bars and coffee shops because the markup is so high on those items. And the reason the markup is so high <coughs> is because it's mostly water, right? It's ice and it's, and it's coffee with, with beans that get roasted. I, I'm, I'm really concerned that we, we didn't get the pilot program payments in yet, so we found a way to tax through a backdoor mechanism, 
hospitals, nonprofits, and the the fire provision, which was going to be in in it originally, isn't in there. So we've gone from the consultant said that we needed a more stable revenue stream, and we've removed the fire provision and then given a subsidy to some people, and they're saying that we're doing that because we want to make conservation. So we, we increase costs on the, on the high users. Well, what if we achieve what we want? What if we achieve that? What if people start conserving? So now we've <coughs> subsidized these rates at the cost of these people who started conserving because that's our goal, right, is to have them conserve. Well, now we're in a revenue deficit because we're subsidizing one group, and the people who were using a lot stopped using a lot. And uh, that's how I feel. So please take that into consideration. Thank you very much. Anyone else? <coughs> uh, no one else. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, administrative assistant to call the roll, please. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dorton. Uh, here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Shera. Here. We have a qualm, in fact. We're all in our places with <coughs> faces. So <coughs> we have no uh, hearing schedule for t uh, today. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, are there any one-minute announcements? Yes. The barge? Thank you. I think um, a lot of you counselors probably got an email on this. The Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women. There will be a public hearing on women's issues Tuesday, February 23rd, 4.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. The North Yet Municipal Building, City Council Chambers. So hopefully <coughs> um, a lot of women who are out there will attend this open public hearing. I think the citizens in this city really should get involved in many of the agencies because there are really some good questions to be asking about women's issues and our concerns. You will. Okay. We're going to have a short meeting tonight? I don't know. Uh, Your Honor, this uh, communications and proclamations from the mayor. Yes, I have one uh, proclamation I'd like to um, uh, read this evening. Good evening, uh, counselors. Um, it is entitled uh, Montessori Education Week, uh, February 28th through March 5th, 2016. Whereas, based on her observations of children and the manner by which they learn, <coughs> Dr. Maria Montessori developed an innovative philosophy of education in the early 1900s that continues to influence learning across the world and in the Pioneer Valley. And whereas, as a system for education for children from birth through the age of 18, the Montessori program uses materials, techniques, and observations that support <coughs> the student's natural development, encourage their learning, independence, and self-confidence, and advance the principles of peace through responsible citizenship. And whereas the Montessori method includes developmental teaching, one-to-one -one lessons, and the promotion of respect among the children and peace to humankind, now therefore I, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor of the City of Northampton, do hereby proclaim February 22nd through 28th, 2015 as Montessori Education Week throughout the City of Northampton and encourage all residents to recognize the valuable contributions made by Montessori schools worldwide and by the Montessori School of Northampton in our city. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the seal of the City of Northampton, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor. And we are joined this evening by Susan Swift, who is the head of school at the Montessori School of Northampton. And I wanted to call her up and, uh, and present this to her in honor of <coughs> the upcoming Montessori Education Week. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. And if you want to say <coughs> words, yeah. Sure. Um, I want to thank all of you for and the city of Northampton for making a Montessori Education Week. It's a wonderful program, a wonderful <coughs> educational system, and we've had the privilege of being in the Northampton area for almost 40 years now. So we are thrilled to be part of the community <coughs> and look forward to many more years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> procedural question. In the future, can we have on the agenda listed what the proclamation proclamations would be? Because I, I think that you know, if it's 
you know, there, there are many, there are many different topics. And if, if uh, we want to like put out to the constituents that it's going to be on the agenda, they can watch it, or some may, may want to come. Um, and I just think that it, if we know what they're going to be, they should certainly be on the agenda. <coughs> Your Honor, the did you, did you hear the request? It was. Um, you know, the charter s prescribes that there's a time for communications from the mayor. And right. I, I, I'm not asking you to vote on them. I'm not, it's not asking you to. Um, so I'm, I don't know from sometimes from week to week what I'll have right. for no, And in so Council so Adams, yeah, that, I, I think we're my point just entirely. I mean, I, I don't think it's illegal or against the charter. I'm not, yeah. That's not my suggestion. I just think if, if you know in advance. If I know if, if we can do it, sometimes we try to get them on, but, if, but it's, it's hit or miss sometimes. Okay. Thank you. So, but I'll, I, we can try to work on that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay. So now we're up to resolutions. The first resolution, of course, is that you heard uh, <coughs> mentioned in uh, in public comment uh, is 16.023. This is a resolution to oppose uh, the TPP and any similar trade agreements. The <coughs> This is upon the recommendation of City Councilors uh, Maureen T. Carney, Lisa F. Klein, and Council President William H. Dwight. Um, this is a re uh, resolution to oppose the TPP and <coughs> trade deals if they fail to restructure the misguided and failed policies of the past and be resolved by the City Council of the City of Northampton and the City Council assembled as follows. Whereas the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or also AKA the TPP is a trade agreement among the 12 Pacific Rim countries concerning a variety of matters of economic policy, which was reached on the 5th of October 2015 after seven years of negotiations. And whereas U.S. trade deals for the past 25 years have been corporate driven, incorporating rules that skew benefits to economic elites while requiring working families to bear the brunt of such policies, and whereas the growing trade deficits driven by the North American Free Trade Agreement, or also known as NAFTA, China's accession to the World Trade uh, Organization and the U.S.-Korea uh, Free Trade Agreement has displaced from the U.S. 700,000, and uh, there's a zero missing jobs, 3.2 million jobs, I mean, uh, uh, and 75,000 jobs, respectively. And whereas between <coughs> the year 2000 and 2015, U.S. employment and manufacturing dropped by 5 million, and whereas Jobs lost due to trade de uh, devastate families and entire communities and can permanently reduce lifetime earnings for hundreds of thousands of workers. And whereas the long decline of the American manufacturing base exacerbated by bad trade policies that reward outsourcing has undermined our econ economic security and poses a threat to our national security. And whereas the offshoring of manufacturing and service jobs deprives local and state governments of sorely needed revenues jeopardizing the livelihoods of millions of public servants as well as construction workers whose jobs depend on infrastructure building, repair, and maintenance. And whereas under NAFTA-style <coughs> trade rules, the U.S. annual trade deficit has increased dramatically from $70 billion in 1993, the year before NAFTA went into effect, to more than $508 billion <coughs> And whereas the disproportionate voice of the powerful global corporation in the formation of U.S. free trade agreements has advanced an agenda that undermines the public interest and threatens democracy, and whereas NAFTA and all but two of the U.S. trade deals that follow to it include <coughs> special legal rights for foreign investors, known as Investor to State Dispute Settlements, or ISDS, a private justice system that undermines uh, U.S. sovereignty and democratic control over our economy by allowing foreign firms to bypass state and federal courts to challenge state and federal laws, regulations, and administrative and judicial decisions in international tribunals. And whereas foreign investors have already used NAFTA's ISDS provisions to challenge decisions regarding the local building permits, environmental regulations, state bans on toxic chemicals, and decisions of state courts, and whereas the climate change and environmental degradation threaten communities across the globe, and ISDS provisions in the Trans-Pacific Partnership may expose nations enacting policies to fight climate change to ISDA cases that undermine these efforts. And whereas promoting economic growth with equity in Northampton requires an approach that reforms the entire trade negotiation process to ensure that voices of workers, farmers, small businesses, families, and communities are heard and their interests addressed, 
And whereas the TPP has been negotiated in secret, effectively shutting state and local governments out of the process, limiting our ability to influence its rules to ensure the people of Northampton can participate in the benefits of trade, and whereas given the enactment fast-track negotiation authority, states, localities, and their citizens will have no opportunity to correct shortcomings in the TPP since its text will not be made public until it's final and no longer can be improved. And whereas represent, uh, representing <coughs> old mistakes in negotiating new trade agreements such as the TPP represents a missed opportunity to strengthen our economy, reduce income inequality, and promote sustainable growth. Now therefore, be a resolve that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts, one, calls upon our elected officials in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives to oppose the TPP and any, any similar trade deals if they fail to restructure the misguided and failed policies of the past. And two, hereby request that the city council, that the council clerk, well, in this case, the administrative assistant, forward suitably engrossed copies of this resolution to the Massachusetts delegation to the United <coughs> States Senate and the United States Congress on behalf of the entire city council. I'll accept a motion. Move approval. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Uh, discussion. I oh, believe I, I would just uh, point out that there's also a letter that um, was delivered to the council president's office from. Yep, it's right and here. I, if I think now would be an appropriate time to read that letter from. Oh look. Our copies. From our representative in Congress, <coughs> from representative. <coughs> I'm opening the letter now. <laughs> no check. No check. Uh, th this is from um, Congressman James P. McGovern. Um, dear Council President White, I write to express my appreciation that the Northampton City Council will be considering a resolution at February 18, 2016 City Council meeting to oppose the TPP and similar trade deals if they fail to restructure the misguided failed policies of the past. It has always been my experience that such resolutions and the debate they engender are helpful to me here in Congress when these matters are brought before the U.S. House of Representatives for a debate and vote. The views of my constituents in the cities and towns in the 2nd Congressional District are very important in how I assess the merits of legislation. <coughs> I share many of the views and concerns expressed in the resolution that is being offered by Councilors uh, Carney, Klein, and you. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is an extensive trade agreement involving 12 Pacific nations, which will have far-reaching effects on our laws and our economy for decades. Last October, these 12 nations, the United States, Japan, Malaysia, Vietnam, Singapore, Brunei, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Mexico, Chile, and Peru concluded five years of negotiations on November 6th. The text of this agreement was made public and on February 4, 2016, the trade ministers of the 12 nations met in Auckland, New Zealand to formally sign the agreement. It now has a two-year period during which it must be ratified, and currently it is my understanding that the leadership of both the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate has no plans to bring the TPP up for consideration prior to the <coughs> elections. I reject the simplistic debate we hear too often that trade is either categorically good or bad. We all recognize that trade can be beneficial. However, today's trade agreements and our global trade <coughs> system are far more complex than the simple agreements of the past, and this is especially true for an agreement as monumental as the TPP. We need to ask ourselves whether today's trade agreements, including the TPP, advance the ability of our workers to find quality jobs at quality wages. We need to ask whether the TPP will revitalize manufacturing and job creation here at home or further encourage U.S. companies to move their production offshore to other TPP countries. We, fur we further, <coughs> excuse me, we need to ask whether these trade agreements promote the public health of our communities, protect our citizens as consumers, and safeguard the quality of our environment. Then we need to ask whether new drugs and medicines will be available in a timely manner and affordable to our citizens and indeed to all people, including the most vulnerable here at home and abroad. I also believe we need to ask whether this agreement will help or harm workers, small farmers, and vulnerable people in all nations that are party to the TPP. We need to know that laws and regulations approved by our city and state governments will not be overturned in favor of foreign corporate interests because of an ed adjudication procedures uh, established in trade negotiations. And we need to be sure that the TPP and other trade agreements will allow us to address 
and not further exacerbate our country's growing economic inequality and stagnant middle class. And we need to be sure that the value of our goods and services will not be undermined by the, manip the, manip blah, the manipulation of other nations' currencies. And after careful examination of these questions and reading and listening to proponents and opponents of the TPP, I have concluded that the TPP will not advance the best interests of our citizens, especially in the matters noted above. I have therefore decided that I will oppose the TPP unless the final legislation that may be taken up by the House provides significant changes and enforceable conditions that make it more responsive to the needs of the American worker, the American consumer, our environment, and local and state governments. Once again, thank you for taking up the serious matter of the TPP and how trade agreements affect our daily life and economy. And I look forward to your debate and vote on the resolution at the February 18th meeting of the uh, Northampton City Council. Sincerely, James P. McGovern, Member of Congress. Uh, Councilor Carney. Uh, thank you. Um, I was happy to be able to have a brief conversation with Congressman McGovern um, when we were at the All Are Welcome uh, dinner that occurred a few weeks ago, and um, uh, Congressman McGovern did share my concerns about the TPP when I talked about bringing this forward to the City Council. <coughs> he also um, made a point of saying that resolutions such as these um, are really helpful for him when he comes to uh, on the floor uh, of the U.S. House um, because they do confirm um, his position his position on matters if it's clear that his constituents, especially um, if it comes from those representatives from city and town um, select boards and city councils. So I was um, I was very happy that he uh, agreed to support to support the resolution and to send us this letter to that effect. Um, and just a, you know, I mean, I, the, in many ways, the resolution speaks for itself, and the folks who came up here um, made some very salient points. In my day job, I work for the AFL-CIO, and I specifically manage the dislocated worker program uh, across the state of Massachusetts. And it's it's been in the 12 years that I've been in that position, it's been heartbreaking to go into communities all across the state where um, uh, plants have been shut down and moved to um, to other countries for, simply for lower wages. And many of those have been um, made possible by trade agreements that we've passed and that we have passed in the past, such as NAFTA. Um, what, what it's been clear that this trade agreement goes well beyond even a lot of the uh, negative um, factors of the, of the NAFTA, especially in the ISDS that was described, the, um, the way that uh, there can be international tribunals that undermine our very laws around la labor laws, around the environment, and um, it's just been it, it's been really heartbreaking, as I said, to go into communities where we've seen jobs eradicated. Um, the most recent, as people have probably followed, is the carrier uh, manufacturer that has um, decided to move its. Um, jobs to Mexico. Um, Northampton doesn't have a lot of manufacturing. I mean, we have Cole Morgan L3. Um, it's changed its name too. But um, in the last, I think it was three years ago, um, they did see a couple of dozen jobs lost, not directly due to trade. In that case, since they're a defense contractor, there was a specifically we'd lost a lot of defense funding, and that caused um, them to to downsize. Um, but I would hate to see trade policies such as these passed that undermined their ability to be able to compete in a global market. So um, I, I just hope that Congressman McGovern is able to, um, as he had said, be, uh, bring, once this does come to, to a vote, if there aren't uh, <coughs> provisions really some serious rethought and provisions given to labor laws and the economy, I mean, and the environment, then um, I really hope that this doesn't pass um, when it comes up later on this year. So I think that's, I'll, I'll leave my remarks to that and let other po folks speak to the matter as they will. Councilor Klein, did you want to? 
Um, I have some remarks, and I actually have a lot of notes because this is uh, this is information that I'm kind of learning about as we uh, develop the resolution. So bear with me. Um, I think what's interesting about the TPP is that it's the biggest trade pact ever. It's going to supplant NAFTA, and also U.S. accords with Chile, uh, Peru, and Australia, and. Countries want to ratify this because they're eager to create what they call a favor favorable climate for investment, and they also want to show deference to the economic power that the United States <coughs> represents. Um, the Obama administration wanted to have this signed in February, if I'm correct about this, mm -hmm. and then send it to Congress for a vote in May. And as the presidential campaigns have kind of been developing and the candidates have been voicing their thoughts about the TPP on both sides of the aisle, negative thoughts, um, we're reconsidering this. So I think it's interesting that this is really a, 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 a national moment looking at the TPP. Um, Hillary Clinton had said that she supported the TPP. She recently um, made statements that she may not. Uh, Bernie Sanders has all along opposed it resoundingly. And then on the other side of the aisle, we have Donald Trump calling it insanity, and Ted Cruz says he also will vote against it. So we have um, opposition from both sides of the aisle. Uh, and the big piece that really catches my attention is these um, investor state dispute settlement courts, ISDS. Um, U.S. trade representatives have been saying that it promotes development, it um, promotes a rule of law, it's good governance around the world. Um, and interestingly, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who um, we also could get a very similar letter from, I believe, to the one we got um, from Congressman McGovern, says that the ISDS clause is the one that everyone should be opposing. It's just, it's, it, it's what needs to, uh, essentially pull away our support from the TPP. The ISDS courts allow foreign corporations to sue governments, and what this means is, is it, it forces sovereign governments into a private arbitration system that's really dangerous. It um, leaves governments vulnerable to really expensive legal battles. Um, when foreign investors say that they've suffered losses because of government actions, they, uh, they can sue, essentially. And the, process, the processes that are described in the TPP for the ISDS courts are not transparent. They don't allow for civil society input. Um, there's an example of how this already played out with NAFTA, actually, with a, a similar kind of ISDS process um, when Obama halted the Keystone XL pro pipeline project, the government of Canada sued for or is demanding $15 billion from the U.S. government. So that's one very concrete example that we see of this ISDS kind of process. It also ensures that workers, unions, consumers, communities, all kinds of stakeholders who should be protected by government regulations, they get shut out of these arbitration processes that the ISDS uh, would essentially create. Um, it doesn't allow victims to hold investors and corporations accountable for wrongdoings. Unions, NGOs, all kinds of civil society <coughs> stakeholders can't be parties in arbitration when they're victimized. So the ISDS process is truly a uh, um, for me, it really blocks any usefulness that something like the TPP could offer us, um, especially because we have an increasingly pro-corporate Supreme Court right now that has essentially shut the door on suits um, from foreign entities. We need to not uh, bolster that with something like the TPP. and. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say. I, I have so many notes. I've learned so much about this, but clearly um, our voice here in Northampton is an important piece of the puzzle of how local communities can say no to the TPP. Thanks. Other comments, debate, discussion? Councilor Adams? I, uh, I know, aside from what I've heard tonight and read in the resolution, I know very little about this, um, about the, this big policy. Um, 
I'm ready to talk water and sewer fees rates tonight, but I frankly I, I don't know that much about this policy other than what I've heard, and I have a lot of, I have a lot of respect for everybody I've heard tonight. Um, I don't abstain because I don't have a conflict, and I my rule as a counselor, my seven years as a counselor is I won't abstain because I don't have a conflict. Um, I ch I'm going to choose to vote no, and. <coughs> Um, I'll educate myself. I mean, I, I think I've heard a lot tonight about, about the good reasons to oppose it, but I, I have to learn if there's another view. I have to, and if, if they're out there, I, I want to learn what that is. Um, I'm not prepared to go on record opposing something um, and voting yes on this at this point. Sorry. Well, I think it's important to point out that um, it's actually not opposing. It's calling for it's calling for more scrutiny, essentially. So that, and, and that, that's. I, I'm sorry, I'm just reading the title, which is a resolution to right. oppose the TPP. So I mean, that's yeah, something I, I made up. That's actually in the title. No, so. I, I agree. I think that I think uh, I have a problem with the title too, because I think the uh, title is a little ornate. And but if it, it, the body of the the text of the resolution principally calls for and and and. Congressman McGovern also requesting the opportunity for more scrutiny and more deliberation and more safeguards. So, uh, as he said, he's, he stands in opposition of it now, but is prepared to change his mind given the deliberation. And, and in fact, actually, the, the what we're asking for is modification adjustment to the the policies as they stand now in order to make it more equitable, fair, and safe. So. I'm not not arguing for you to change your vote. I'm just saying for for purpose for these purposes, it's not a blanket objection to the pro, to the policies, only insofar as a request that we we be more, uh, to devote more energy and thought on the impacts that that uh, we believe that have, have been overlooked. Councilor Sherr. I, I agree with Councilor Adams, and I'd feel more comfortable if we changed the title of it. I don't I don't feel versed in the geopolitics of a 12-nation trade agreement to be able to outright oppose it without hearing other views, like he said. Um, and But I agree that it, it should be looked at more thoroughly. So I would feel more comfortable if we changed the title of it. Uh, uh, Oh, Councilor Bidwell, you haven't had a chance to speak yet, so. Um, I, I must admit, I, I came here this evening um, <laughs> expecting that I would abstain from this because it's an incredibly complicated agreement. I don't pretend to have uh, become an expert on it since I first read the resolution and spent a little bit of time doing some homework. Uh, and the more I do a little bit of homework on it, the more I'm impressed with the divergence of sophisticated economic argument on this. And uh, including progressive economists who have argued this both ways. Um, so in, I guess my conclusion still is that I, I, I intend to abstain because I don't, I know that I'm not going to know enough about this to bring a truly informed opinion. And echoing uh, Councillor Adams' comments, I, I think that my constituents, I'll find out from them if they disagree, certainly, but I think they'd probably rather have me digging in on water and sewer rates and other pressing matters than becoming an expert on the TPP. So um, for those reasons, I, I think I'm sticking with my conviction to uh, abstain on this. Councillor Adams. If it's important to the sponsors to, to, you know, have us have more time so that maybe there can be a more a greater statement potentially in the end of support if, if that's what comes of it, you know, we can postpone the vote. But I'm going to stick with a no vote for now. Thank you. Well, one proposal to amend the title, one proposal to amend, uh, to postpone. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell. I'd like to ask a question. I mean, it's it's pretty clear this is a resolution to oppose the TPP because it's not just the title. It's also, I believe, the the resolution at the end, just to right. clear that up. And right. that item is calls upon the elected officials in the United States and the uh, Senate and the House of Representatives to oppose the TPP oppose. Yeah. and any similar trade deals if they fail to restructure the misguided failed policies of the past. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to have that yeah. be clear. Yeah. Um, I I just um, want to point out that what Congressman McGovern has said is that he has made the decision that he will oppose the TPP. He will oppose it if it 
um, maintains the misguided and fails policies of the past is what I what I read, and let, meaning that if he do, if <coughs> there aren't enough safeguards, if he does not have the opportunity to make those amendments that would be required for labor rights and for environmental concerns. So um, I actually see the title is one that leaves open the door with that with that subjunctive with that f if and so um, I, I don't know I've, I heard I, I know Council Councillor Sierra asked to, to change I'm not sure but if there's something offered if there's a change in the title that would be offered I'm not I'm not sure what it would be um, I mean I it's it's not um, my resolution, so I would be happy to have one of the sponsors suggest a change, but um, I mean, it does have if in it. Councilor Klein. I, I, I'm not actually personally interested in changing that title. I feel like it is about opposition. I feel like if we look at <coughs> past trade agreements uh, that have been made by this country, NAFTA and CAFTA to wit, um, and we look at the outcomes and the ways in which I think one of our um, very smart labor unionists who spoke in the public comment period talked about um, that this is really an outsourcing deal. This is a way that the United States uses trade agreements to outsource for really cheap labor um, in countries where there aren't environmental protections, labor protections. Um, the maquiladoras in Central America are one of the examples of what came out of NAFTA, where much U.S. production went down to maquiladoras in Central America. People were paid, are paid pennies for their work there. Uh, there's no environmental regulations so that uh, the waters all along the Caribbean coast um, around Mexico have been become so polluted by um, the kind of effluvia that have come out of the, the maquiladoras so that the, the coasts can't be used for fishing, swimming. Um, and these are things that the United States talks about um, you know, prizing. We, we really, we believe in environmental protections. We believe in pr the protection of workers' rights. Yet with these trade agreements, when we outsource, when we, when companies are uh, receiving incentives to go into countries that don't have these kinds of protections, we're allowing the degradation, I think, globally of um, both the environment and, and human rights, human and civil rights. And I think that this trade agreement has the way that it's structured will continue to do so in countries that are poorer than the United States, that, that feel like they need this relationship with the United States. And um, I, I just think morally and uh, politically, socially, it's really important that we express our opposition to this. So that's where I stand as one of the co-sponsors of this piece of legislation, this this ordinance, I should say. Uh, Councilor Dow. I actually really appreciate the thoughtfulness that I've heard from my colleagues tonight, and it's not appropriate to rush to approve uh, one thing uh, any, anything without careful deliberation. And so I appreciate that my colleagues are giving it careful deliberation because indeed um, it's a sprawling uh, proposal. Um, it, it's 12 countries, you add them up, it's almost a billion people, it's four continents, it's a, it's a trade pact that governs what, 40% of the world's economy. And it's everything, it's like literally everything. When I was looking at it, it's you know, it's, I'm sure it's cranberries in Massachusetts and electronics in Japan and f oranges in Florida and, you know, it's everything. And the complex economic rules and domestic um, uh, tariffs that we attach to different products in different ways, on and on and on. So it's tremendously complicated. I'll just give you my opinion, uh, uh, having emphasized my respect for the complexity and the deliberation that my colleagues are giving us, which is appropriate and maybe more time if that's needed. Um, my opinion of it is, it's like if you look at your car and you know the, the tire is, has been slashed. You know the car's not going anywhere just by looking at the tire. You don't have to look at the, en at the engine. You don't have to have knowledge of the engine and the carburetor and the muffler and the suspension and everything else. You know the car is broken because of one thing, 
Um, and for me, that one thing is the, um, the, the trend that it keeps us on um, to, uh, towards empowering corporations in, in a way that I think is undemocratic. I remember when I came um, here and actually provided public comment when I was um, not a counselor, and it was about a, uh, a resolution that Councillor Dwight had um, co-sponsored. Uh, I don't remember who else co-sponsored it, but it was about Citizens United. And the example I gave was, I believe it was a Massachusetts case, actually, um, where a, a tobacco company had a, a billboard and um, <coughs> it advertised smoking, and, a, and because of that, a law came about that said you can't have such a billboard or advertisement within a certain distance of a school. And that was ultimately, uh, that challenge to, to this law that was democratically enacted was ultimately upheld and overturned because of this fiction of corporate free speech and corporate personhood. My concern and the reason I appreciate this, this resolution is that we're moving beyond corporate, corporate personhood, as others have said, towards corporate nationhood. And I think that is a very disturbing trend. So for me, that's the slash tire. All the other stuff I totally uh, acknowledge b beyond my pay grade. But I know that, and I share that concern, I believe, with uh, uh, Senator Warren and, and others who've identified that as a central issue um, in terms of adjudicating major issues that should have democratic accountability built into them, but I don't believe are. So that, that's my problem with the proposition in general, and that's why I support the resolution. But again, I appreciate the debate on it. Council LeBarge. Yes, um, I'm going to support this resolution. <coughs> Being a union rep for AFL-CIO for 31 years, the voice of the people are very, very important. And there's no question about it. We heard it tonight. We heard them come in front of the microphone to tell us, as citizens, as union workers, the importance of this resolution. And I do know for a fact, even in the city of East Hampton, which is a corporation, and I'm not going to mention the name, where many people have worked there for many, many years, one of my neighbors got affected with it. They would just bring you into a room, all of yours, and it would be by number, come into our office, they're done. Could not afford their homes anymore. They had no jobs. I agree with this resolution. I don't have a problem with the language on it. I think it's putting it right where it's at. I think the jobs that have been lost and the families and the working people and people who work in factories, <coughs> enough is enough. And I am very pleased to see that Jim McGovern has also written this letter. It tells you something. I mean, he himself works very, very hard on important issues, and I'm going to support this resolution. Um, actually, to Councilor O'Donnell's point, and, and actually Councilor Adams' point as well, I mean, it's interesting tonight we are, and, and public comment from Wes, um, we are discussing <coughs> Water and sewer. The, this is something, a power that was recently conferred upon us as representatives who are accountable to the public, <coughs> that we get to actually determine these rates, whereas before it was not quite as transparent and as accessible. And in actually to a Councilor O'Donnell's point, this, this slash tire point is, and, and Councilor Klein pointed this out as well, and this is the one that gives me the most discomfort. The fact that actually those opportunities where we, you know, we have a plastic bag ban uh, in Northampton that was uh, sponsored by uh, uh, Councilor Adams along with Councilor Spector and that there is there's a possible scenario that that would not be recognized or, or accommodated because, despite the fact that this uh, this was vetted in this community by representatives who are accountable to the people. Having that, any opportunity, not only this community, but any other community in this city, it kind of runs counter to what theoretically we believe in. If we were starting to accede to um, corporate decisions and free market governance, 
capitalism is a system. It's not the form of government that we have. And we're not, we're a mixed economy. We, we, we're, we have socialism, we have capitalism, we have, we have a mishmash of things that, that make us a first world nation. But one of the most important things is the, the Constitution that uh, ascribes us the opportunity to, to make our own decisions, to manifest our own destiny, and not have that destiny fabricated as a policy by a corporation that will, will trump our participation. And that's actually what informs my uh, sponsorship of this. So I, I, um, I, it is my profound hope that we are able to pass this and send this on to Congressman McGovern to give him the reinforcement that, uh, on the floor where he can make his case and hopefully <laughs> our voice is amplified and our concerns are expressed more directly. Any other discussion on the point? Uh, why don't we have a roll call vote? Councilor Bidwell. Abstain. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Abstain. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Abstain. Councilor Adams. No. So we have three abstentions, five yes, one no. Mm -hmm. The resolution passes. In first reading, we'll have a chance to revisit this uh, in <coughs> next council meeting. Okay. The consent agenda. And this included in the consent agenda is the minutes of this meeting, of the last meeting, February 4th, 2016, uh, the minutes of the January 28th, 2016 Joint Council of uh, uh, City Council and the School Committee, and then a petition from Electric Eye Records of 52 Main Street. Florence is a dealer of secondhand articles. I'll have a motion. Um, move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> now we recess for finance. Uh, uh, and we spring into action. We spring into action, uh, Council Murphy. Excellent, Pam, would you call the roll of finance? Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Labarge. Present. Uh, first item is to approve the minutes of January 21st, 2016. Do we have a motion? Second. Second. Any discussion on minutes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Uh, the next is a financial order. Um, it's 16.031, financial order for free cash for the recreation department for modular structure. Uh, on the recommendation of the mayor, order that $70,000, that's an additional $70,000, be appropriated from the FY16 general fund, undesignated fund balance, uh, also known as free cash for the purpose of funding design services, site preparation, and utility procurement and construction of a 2,160 square foot modular office building to serve as the administrative headquarters of the Northampton Parks and Recreation Department. The mayor is here to speak to this request. Yes, uh, meaning, um, so you may recall that I came to you several months ago and we asked for a donation of $400,000 um, based on our best estimates of, um, of what a project like this might come in at. Um, we had uh, a, um, over a dozen um, folks who took out bid packets when we issued the, um, the bid solicitation. We had, uh, you know, six or seven that came to actually look at the site and, and get more information. And then on Tuesday, we opened the bids and the, um, uh, the number came in, the low bid came in at uh, 414,000. Um, and so, uh, which we had expected it to come in below 400,000, but that's, that's what we had projected, but that's not what it came in at. So um, my reason for asking for this additional, well, we need the 14,000 at a minimum to sign the contract um, and to get the process moving. Um, but what I'm, what I'm asking for the additional funds for, which we may not in fact need. So on the 414, um, we want to be able to add a contingency, about 10% contingency, which is fairly standard. 
just in case we encounter any additional problems. Um, and then we also need to have um, 5,000, uh, which is not part of the bid package, to basically connect our fiber optic, our, our um, municipal fiber optic system to this unit so that they can connect to the, um, to the city's computer system. So we'll, we'll do that through um, a contractor that we use to do all of our INET work. Um, and then we also have a, an additional 10,000 in there for, um, to cover the design costs, which we thought would have been covered under the 400, but obviously the bid came in higher. So it's 414 is the total contract price for the entire construction, uh, installation, all of that. Um, and then we've got the fiber optic, the design, and then the contingency that we're adding so that we don't have to come back to you if there's some uh, unexpected overrun. We'll at least have something in a contingency fund. But we hope not to have to do that because it is a fairly straightforward project. Um, there is actually a... Um, there's a zoning board hearing uh, next Thursday, um, and I know all of the abutters have been notified of that. So um, uh, David Pomerantz will be going forward on a site plan for site plan next Thursday, and um, and our goal is to try to get the contract signed so that we can um, they can fulfill the goal of getting it operational for June, so that the rec Parks and Rec Department can be moved in. So that's why we're asking for two readings on this additional funding. Um, so that we don't have to wait an, another two weeks, which will delay the contract, which will push the project out even further. Mm -hmm. Questions? Councilor Barch? Yes. Mayor, could you explain on the procurement part of this? I mean, we have Joe Cook. He's our procurement officer, correct? Yes, and we, we did a very extensive procurement. We um, issued an RFP, um, you know, so we, we solicited bids from uh, uh, firms that that uh, you know install these, uh, manufacture and install these. And um, again, we had um, I forgot the exact number, but he'll have it. You know, over a dozen companies took out bid packets, which is what happens. Um, then we had others that, and then we had people who came for a sort of a technical meeting to get more information. Um, but at the end of the day, this is the this is the low bid. Um, so, and, and you know, when we when we estimated this, we we tried. I think David Pomerantz looked at pricing, looked at similar size buildings and other projects, and that's how we developed the four hundred thousand dollar budget. Um, the low bid was four fourteen. So, right. But Joe Cook gets paid by the city anyways. <coughs> correct. I'm not sure what you don't, mean. Don't we use Joe Cook to do this? Oh yeah, Joe oversaw this uh, procurement most definitely. Okay. And David, but I mean David Pomerantz, because it's within his department, um, worked on all of the technical specifications. But uh, but Joe is the overseer of the bid process, so he has he makes sure that we follow uh, uh, the you know Chapter Thirty. Uh, B, which is the state's procurement process, which we did, and you know, so. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Councilor Klein. Yes. Um, I know that these additional funds aren't being earmarked for the things that came up in the uh, the meeting we had with the abutters that are Ward Seven residents. When you say additional things. The additional funds that we're approving, we're voting on tonight. Okay. Um, but I do just want to go on record saying that I think it's really important. I would um, be really happy to approve even more funding if we can make sure that yeah. the, the needs and the requests yep. of the abutters are, are respected. And I think the most important of those being uh, the piece around having the heating and cooling system inside the building to make sure that the noise level is low because this really is a building that's going up right in the backyard of two uh, folks who live in Ward 7. Yeah, we specified in the bid that they could there couldn't be any rooftop units at all. Excellent. So this is a proposal that Great. has no rooftop units because I know that was one of the concerns. Um, that's wonderful. Actually, I didn't have an idea, but I brought it anyway. Um, the bid also includes... Um, well, it's kind of a flat rendering, but it also includes, because I know this is important to your constituents, um, it's installation of a dense eight-foot tall uh, sort of additional a green, things a behind, green screen behind the building. 
Um, these are the big existing ones that are there already, mm -hmm. um, but we're going to be putting in a dense, you know, they're eight foot tall, um, uh, eastern red cedar, juniperus, Virginia. So, uh, they grow. so that's going to provide a really dense screening behind the building as well. Um, so that's actually part of that contract. So Great. We, we built all I'm that. glad that you're sharing that because we didn't yeah. yet we didn't yet have access to the maps. I think they just went up today. But yeah. when the abutters letter went out, we didn't see the revised map, so people hadn't gotten yeah. that sense of what. Yeah. Was so this was this is sort of the specs that they and you know it includes the handicap ramp. It includes all the other uh, all the other um, hookups that have to happen. So it's pretty much a soup to nuts. You know everything from site preparation to paying for the manufacturer of the unit to installing the unit to so pretty much all of that is built into the, uh, what they've been on. And there's no, you can't see it here, um, but there is no rooftop units of any kind that, uh, I mean, there's obviously a heating system and it has to exhaust to the outside. So there's, there's not really such thing as an indoor, there's got to be some exterior exhausting uh, of it. So. Um, I don't think they want a nuclear reactor for this thing. So probably, so yeah, so that's, there's going to be some, but it's not going to be rooftop. I know that was one of the main concerns that they had, and that was specified in the bid. So. And does the site allow for the trees that are there that were put up when the addition was put on to remain in place? I think, I, I think, so, uh, I think most of them, yes, but any <laughs> that are taken down will be replaced with this other tree belt as well. Okay. Um, so I'm, th those are the questions I know when they come next Thursday right. before uh, zoning board for site plan review that those can be addressed uh, Great. at that time. Okay, thank you. Um, I know Berkshire Design uh, worked on this project and, uh, and they're going to be working up um, an even more sort of updates of those three dimensionals that we had from before um, to sort of show the elevations and stuff. So. No, no, uh, 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 Councillor uh, Carney does, if yeah. you don't. Yeah. No, that's why I was, I was indicating Councillor Carney had a question. Um, so, um, two questions. Um, is, is the contractor that's been awarded the contract, been, has that been released? Is that name released yet? Um, Are they a local contractor? Are they? I believe the contractor's name is Vanguard. And they are, I, be, I believe they're from Eastern Massachusetts. And again, these were these are folks that specialize in modular construction. Okay, so my question, I guess, around that is, um, there must be. It, I'm, I'm just wondering how prevailing wage rates apply in a case like this when it's modular construction. I mean, when it's typical construction, you know, there's posted rates for every trade and. Well, it's a public. That. It's a public project, so right. everything we do. Um, generally, that's public requires prevailing wage. Right, but I'm just cu I'm just curious because it's um, because it's a modular construction as opposed to typical construction. If there's, it just seems like yeah. I mean the 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 um, the building is manufactured in a plant in three pieces. Okay. And comes to the site is trucked to the site and will be assembled. I mean it's and it's basically it comes wired insulated finished right. walls it just basically gets attached and they also will be preparing the um the um the f you know the footings and, and so that wage else. rate is probably only applied to those who are on the site i could do some research I, I could do some just, research yeah. yeah i don't it's not know. it's not too much okay i i don't know um i'd have to do some research on that right yeah. okay yep. thank you Councilor um just I'll ask this question. The, the chair of finance can rule me out of order if it's not germane to the discussion, but just with regards to other available space in the city that was discussed when we originally had this whole um, issue come up, and you were open about you know, the FICER building as, as a place that in theory would work, I just wanted to know if there's any update about the, the lease um, negotiations. Um, uh, yeah, that's the, just the, um, the school committee um, uh, put out to bid the lease uh, as as presented to the council and approved by the council and the um, Nonatuck school um, up, up, you know, answered the RFP and I believe we're in the final phases of them signing the lease. Okay. So they I are. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So they're they're um, it's with them. They're going to sign it and right. so they will be given an extension um, 
for 38 months, whatever the terms were. So right, they'll right. be there in the near term. Okay, yeah. Thank you. So. Other questions for the mayor on this? Uh, I now I do have questions. Uh, uh, will um, Central Services be clerking this, uh, the clerk of the works, so that you have uh, yeah. the Pomerantz doing yeah. oversight? And the yeah. I mean, it'll be, it's on school property, but it's a, it's a Central Services will be the ones uh, overseeing it. Um, and it's not a very, it's, as I know we met with the neighbors, it's not a super long um, construction process. Right. It's going to be site prep. <coughs> it's going to be running the utilities. And the water line actually goes right by where the building is. And then a separate contractor will be running the, the, um, the fiber optic connection. But then literally, they're going to show up. Um, it's probably going to be on flatbeds. And, and, and they'll just crane it into place and assemble it. Right. And so I, I didn't, Then they'll I, build the handicap ramp. I'd imagine then that there's no real potential savings to be realized as you do with sometimes when you have a project that you can you can do some savings in construction. This is pretty solid, straightforward because it's you're yeah. buying a unit, you're put and it's just assembling it in place. So yeah, but also consequently probably not a lot of room for there wouldn't be as much risk for cost overruns. You have a pretty clear idea what you're. Yeah, I was actually talking with Susan Swift earlier because they did a modular classroom a few years ago, and um, and yeah, very straightforward process. And the pricing was you know several hundred thousand for theirs as well. Um, so there are some uh, just something that came up recently that that actually the Gazette wrote an editorial about the in, up at the prison. They have modular structures that are actually, they, they had, uh, I think, built into it like a 20-year practical use uh, mm -hmm. lifespan. Is that what we're looking at here for this? Yeah, I mean, we, we realize that it's, um, that these have a, you know, 10 to 20-year lifespan. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we understand, we, we're expecting it to be a, a long-term solution because we don't, frankly have the funds to build a standalone parks and rec facility at this point but it's at least going to give them a place to move into and you know i would point to the building g at smith vocational which you know 20 right. years ago we probably put you know two or three hundred thousand dollars into you know and that's at 20 years ago costs to take an old building and turn it into the office buildings that that it were so you know and and the Rec park and rec department was there for 20 years, and so now we're moving somewhere else. They're kind of the nomads of, uh, <laughs> of unfortunately. Unfortunately. But we think this is actually going to be a really good location. So, um, and and these, I mean, if you've seen these buildings, I mean, this is a very, uh, uh, you know, this is not a FEMA trailer. This, right. These are these are, you know, it's probably it's probably a better quality building than the one they're in now at Smith Folk. Actually, I'm I'm actually positive it's a better quality building insulation wise um, electrical wiring just all that stuff it's going to be a better building so and quiet for the neighbors too I have to emphasize that uh, more questions for the mayor on this one Sin uh, yes please so, I mean, since, since the quality is so high what gives it such a short lifespan why well, I, I mean I don't know that it's uh, like I, I guess I'll have to, I'll, I'd like to check on the lifespan of it. I mean, I, I know the ones that they built up at the up at the um, up at the jail. I think I suspect they're probably getting a little bit harder use up at the jail than than this office building will will get. I mean, I know some of the things they were having up there were some leaks and they were having some um, cracking of wall, you know, board and things like that, and um, some of those kinds of things. Um, you know, we'll be obviously taking care of it and maintaining it, and we're counting on <coughs> doing that. So we're going to try to make it last as long as we can. Um, yeah. Any more questions in finance? Then all in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Uh, the next thing on our agenda is 16.003, an ordinance to delete fees from Chapter 174 of the City Code Book. On the recommendation of Mayor Narkowitz, an ordinance, the City of Northampton, providing that the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton be amended by revising uh, chapter 174 of said code providing that f providing for fees uh, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton 
uh, in the City Council assembled as follows. One, that Section 174 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended so that such, such sections shall read as follows. Section uh, Chapter 174 deleted. <coughs> chapter 174 shall be deleted in its entirety and replaced with the following wording. Um, see fee schedule on the Northampton website. And the mayor's here to comment on this one too. Yeah, I mean, this this actually came out of your ordinance review committee that I think several of you sat on, as well as um, as well as Wendy Mazza and Lynn Simmons, and um, it's again part of the ongoing review of the ordinances vis-a-vis -vis the charter, vis-a-vis -vis the administrative code, and um, uh, and the city council several years ago accepted a chapter of Mass General Law, which basically um, delegates to the departments um, the setting of various fees um, within the department. And so right now we have some fees that are in the ordinance book and some fees are just, you know, set at the department level and they're set, you know, by the department. And so these fees, um, because they're actually not voted on by the city council, are we're pulling out of the ordinance book and the idea is we're going to be creating basically a code of regulations that will include any of the regulations or fees that are promulgated by individual departments. So this is sort of, again, more cleanup of the ordinance books by removing these, this whole section of fines out of the code of ordinances. Would a council was on that study group like to comment on that? I'll just add, I'll just add that it, it just, it does not diminish the ability of the departments to set those fees. It just puts them in a different place. So we just because we don't have the code book here, what is the, so uh, what set of fees is listed here that's being deleted? Is it miscellaneous? Is it it's a every, it's, it's whatever departments had their fees uh, listed. Um, I can pull, no, okay. pull it I mean, up or the, maybe. Uh, I mean, is it, is it many? Uh, I think it Pam can maybe pull oh, it up. Okay. She can scroll through it for you. Um, okay, and you could do other things rather than. The problem with it being in the ordinances is, is that if a department uh, decides to change a fee from 20 to $25, um, if it's still reflected in the ordinance book as $20 and they've changed the fee to $25, then it just creates confusion. Um, and so that's why it's not, because re really the ordinance book, the ordinances can't be changed without coming through the city council and mayor. I mean that we can't change the we can't change the ordinance book without that. So when we delete the fees from the code of ordinances, we the fees will still exist. The, yeah, I understand yeah. that there'll be a separate fee schedule that will be accessible. Yes, but it's not located in any. It's not located. Well, we're actually working on. Well, we're actually working on a, a, a set for now a centralized page that'll have all the fees on it. And most departments should have their fees. You know, if you're going to go to the board of health and you want to know what a septic system inspection fee is, you'll find that on their website. Um, or, you know, how much it costs for a, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going to the collector's office and you need a, um, you know, lien certificate or municipal How will lien fees be authorized now by, they won't be authorized by the city council anymore? Yeah, they haven't been for a while. Okay, um, how will they be authorized just they'll by? They'll be authorized by the department's setting reasonable fees and obviously I'll be I'll be monitoring and approving them okay I mean right now under mass general law you know you know neither they nor the city council nor anybody could set like you know a thousand dollar fee for something you know it, the fees under mass general law and under plenty of SJC rulings have to be reasonable and they have to be they have to align with the services that are being provided <coughs> um, so, and, and again, we, the, the city has accepted a chapter of Mass General Law which delegates that to the uh, various departments and agencies okay. um, to set their own fees. Yes. Well, I'm happy to hear, Mayor, that at least you'll be able to have the authority they're ha going to have to come through. Oh, you. of course, no doubt about it. Yeah. Okay, yep. because I think there's concerns, and there was concerns about 
deleting in the fees. I can tell you that right now. Some people have talked no, to me about this. Yeah. No. What what I the way I envision it and is that that if a department um, wants to update their fees on an annual schedule, they'll submit an updated fee schedule and review that, and will it'll be approved, and then it'll be added to this um, this code of regulations. Which <coughs> I'm actually even going to look into. Um, like I don't know if you noticed. Uh, See, one of the other things, for example, and this is not really about fees, but one of the other things that came out of that committee was the planning board's subdivision regulations are in the ordinances, even though by mass general law, subdivision regulations are solely the purview of the planning board. If only the planning board can approve and change. So we, but we have them in our, in our code of ordinances, which so it's sort of a, an odd situation. So we're trying to actually work. We're going to we're going to talk to general code. Um, you know, we did it for the administrative code where we actually created a new category on this on our online ordinance book, which has the charter and it has the ordinances and now it has the administrative code. We're actually going to work with them to see if we can create a code of regulations so that we can put all the very because, you know, the Board of Health creates its own regulations, um, and then there's different regulations that various departments can create. So we're trying to figure out a way to have it searchable and accessible like it is now. It just doesn't belong in the code of ordinances. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, there, there was a question that came up in the ordinance review committee that we talked about. Um, because of a, a memo from uh, the Division of Local Services and Department of Revenue, which seem to state that although fees can be set administratively, it doesn't necessarily remove the authority of the council to set fees. And I just wanted to note that. I'm not sure we can resolve that tonight, but it might be something that the solicitor can discuss with us in legislative matters. Um, and the other idea, just to put it out there again, not really for resolution tonight, but you know, when we put things into the executive um, although you, you are accountable as, as mayor, um, it's a different kind of accountability. And so we also discuss mechanisms that we might explore. You know, if a fee went up steeply over a short period of time, for example, would that trigger a hearing, to a public hearing about it? Just for the purpose of transparency and feedback, which you, you, you don't have, you know, if it's no longer coming through the council. Not like it would happen all the time, but I think that kind of thing is important in general, and so maybe it's something we could explore a, to a reasonable extent, um, especially in legislative matters. So, just to note that. And obviously, the council always has the ability to call in any agency or the mayor uh -huh. to ask a question about a fee increase or any of that kind of stuff. Just like you're talking to me about. So that's always right. you always have that option. That's so, it's just that's a good. Those are good points, and um, if a uh, if a member of the, if a person, any person, um, disagrees that or believes that any fee is unreasonable, their only recourse would be to take the city to court. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's 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 worthwhile considering if you know because because there isn't a, a, as public of a process if 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 it went through a council process, which would entail a public vote. If this is the if that's the best way. Yes, if I can recall. Um, with the reconstruction of Route 66 after mayor it was completed I received calls from um, two paving companies that apparently they were hired to go ahead and do some of the paving on people's driveways and it was not necessarily Route 66 but it was in Ward 6 and at one point, it was $50 for the permit. They, as companies here in Northampton, were never notified of the increase from $50 to $250, which is huge. That's a huge increase. And I didn't know anything about it either. So I had called the director of the Department of Public Works, and I was actually told that the reasons why that was done, it was either to go ahead and lay off some of the staff, go up on the fees. And I really feel that I think it's important with business people that they are notified 
that there's going to be increases like that. They knew nothing about it until they went to apply for that $50 permit, and they were told 250 Okay. I suspect that was probably a PW approved. Uh, that was probably right. a PW. But, uh, yeah. you know, so. if you don't communicate, that's a problem. Okay. I agree with you. Um, you. I do pride myself on communicating with the public on, exactly. on initiatives that I make, and so I think I'll, uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll certainly be able to communicate if there are major fee increases. Thank I think we can. So um, it just, the question remains if whether it uh, um, requires an act of the legislature to change a permit from, you know, $20 to $25, if that's the level. Um, so, but. Other questions? <coughs> Seeing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation. What are we, is this is on the this so is reading the okay. Piece. Good. So I, I lost this track. This is in finance, <laughs> and we had a we have a motion. <coughs> and okay. Second. So all in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. And that's all that's on our agenda. I don't know of any new business. So uh, motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. aye. Thank you. We come out of recess and we're <coughs> back on the regular meeting. And that brings us to item 16.031. This is the financial order for free cash to the Recreation Department for modular structure. <laughs> motion. Second. Second. Is there further discussion on this item? Um, there is a request for two readings. Just a heads up. So, um, discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Sheriff. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Suspend the rule. <coughs> second. Second. Pass in first reading is motion made to suspend the rules to allow for a second reading tonight, and it's been seconded. Any discussion on the suspension of rules? All those in favor of suspension of rules, please say aye. 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 To approve. Second. 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 Motion's been made and seconded for a second reading. <coughs> Discussion? <laughs> Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Kearney? Yes. The motion passes in second reading. Thank you. Um, now we have item 16.030. This is in order to establish water and sewer rates for FY 2017. Uh, this is a referral to the <coughs> Committee on Public Works and Utilities, and I would recommend we'll uh, uh, also a further referral to finance. Um, motions made and seconded. Um, so uh, is, anyone, is everyone comfortable with the addition of uh, additional referral to finance? And there'll be a public hearing. Uh, that's where the public hearing will be held at uh, in the uh, committee of public works and utilities. Your Honor, I just was gonna. I was gonna say I'm happy. To, I, I know that you have a meeting scheduled on the 29th. That's that the, the day first you meeting of, of that. Of that. 22nd. 22nd. What is that? Fourth Monday. Not this Fifth Monday. Monday. No. A week, from <laughs> a week from Monday. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so is that the date you anticipate doing the, what you'd like to do the hearing, or uh, I wanted to just make sure. It's hard to say because we have not we have been incorporated as a committee. We haven't reported our officers yet. And, uh, I know. Uh, so okay. it's, that's the quandary. Okay. Um, so I can't speak for the committee. I am on the committee, but I can't speak okay. for the committee. Because we that's why I had waited uh, till now to, right. to introduce this because I was waiting to see what the committee was going to perform, but now I know you got delayed because of January right. or February. I, there is another alternate possibility that I don't know I would possibly to have a, one of the public hearings or a public hearing in finance, which is fully assembled. Um, yeah, I didn't. I Oh, you mean it outside of this council? Right, 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 right. So a public hearing to discuss so the... So just assign the public hearing to one of the committees. Yeah. Have them hold it. Well, I think we could, uh, if you have no objection, I don't think there's any. No, I, 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 I two, two uh, hearings of. I was just going by your new yeah. rules. Right. That no, it, this was the committee that, that was going to be. Yeah. Um, Although it's harder for the public. So, you know, if there's two events rather than one event, but 
either committee could do it. I think it makes more sense for the Committee on Public Works and Utilities to hold a hearing, okay. just given the scope uh, of the committee. It's uh, <coughs> the mayor, the, the, we at, the timeline starts to tighten up. Yeah, yeah that's one of my and that's, I, I know yeah. that's one of your concerns because if we don't have that public hearing on the 29th, which is difficult to call because this is, we're not assembled, but uh, Councilor Adams, you have a thought? I consider these major changes, I think we should have two public hearings. Yeah. Each, each committee, and, finance and public works. And, and public works can set another date for the hearing. It doesn't have to be at the meeting. That's true. Can that is true. Once we assemble, we could and then pick a day. That is true. So, uh, Council Rodell. Would you have the finance hearing in Council? Because it, I think people probably want to come to the, well, the, the main event. But. The, the public hearing might be easier. And it could be a joint meeting of finance and <coughs> public works committee because there's some overlapping membership. Could be a joint committee meeting for a public hearing on a different day than that committee normally meets, uh, so and and <coughs> kill two birds with one stone and have a joint meeting and public hearing. So I would just wanted to point out that your uh, finance meeting would normally be happening next Tuesday. Yeah. So the twenty third, yeah. and then followed by the twenty. The, the public hearing could be any day we wanted. It. So perhaps we could. Um, try to coordinate that because I'd obviously want to be able to coordinate so that I could be right. there and we could have whoever else we need to have um, be part of that meeting. Um, um, <coughs> I, I also did, well, I think you're in the middle of a vote, but no, I- Well, it's okay. It's, it's, well, it's, is it relevant to the discussion? It is. I just okay. wanted to um, clarify uh, any uh, misconception. Um, you're, the council's being asked to vote on the volumetric water and sewer rates, which is what you do and what you did last time and what the Board of Public Works did. Um, the other uh, fixed departmental fees that are also being recommended by the, um, you know, by the uh, consultant, um, those would, we're still uh, going to be proceeding with those, but those would be things that would be implemented by the department. Um, as have been in, implemented in the past, the the um, the sewer, f um, I mean the uh, the meter fixed fee, and then the new fire line fee would be something that that would be implemented at the departmental level, harkening back to the discussion we just had moments ago. So that's the distinction in terms of the actual water and sewer rates that under the new administrative order that you are I have to present to you to approve. Yes, and. and and actually, I'll, I'll read the order if that helps any, is for the, to clarify your point. It says, order that effectively, effective July 1st, 2016, the per 100 cubic foot rates for water and sewer are as follows. Uh, customers with one inch meter or smaller, that's the tier one consumption, zero to 16 uh, <coughs> uh, cubic foot consumption is $4.73 per CCF. And tier two consumption is uh, lesser than 16. I mean, is greater than 16 would be six point six dollars and 21 cents per CCF. Customers with a meter larger than one inch, all consumption would be six dollars and nine cents per CCF. Non-metered sewer would be seven dollars and 52 <coughs> cents per CCF based on 80 percent of meter uh, metered water consumption and metered water consumption. <coughs> the rate would be seven dollars and fifty-two cents per CCF. <coughs> Councilor Adams. So does that mean the, the fire protection charges would be set unilaterally by Northampton Fire and Rescue? No, that means that they would be set by um, they would be set by DPW. Yeah, they would be set by DPW. Yeah, <coughs> not Fire and Rescue. That's true of the, uh, of the fixed charges as well. That's our that is our yeah that is our intention. C could you just, what we just explain? why the, the volumetric charges are handled one way and the other charges that can have a dramatic impact. Yeah, for, no doubt about for, it. For the, for the rate payer. Yeah. How, how, just explain to me why they, how they're handled separately. Because the, the, uh, the you know, we're viewing them as, as, as a fixed fee to help uh, pay, support the service. Um, in this case, the sort of ongoing maintenance of the, of the system versus the actual consumption rates, which are what the board and the city council have traditionally set. Um, I, you know, they've never 
the, those fixed rates have never been voted on by anybody, um, and they weren't. You know, we didn't have them before you last time when you were voting on the rates themselves. So I realize it's all part of that, right. but I mean, you know, you vote on the tax rate, but you don't vote on the fees that the tax collector charges, and you don't. Uh, you don't vote on the lien fees, and you don't vote on all the other associated fees with running that system. So, um, so certainly, if so, that's that's sort of how it's we're breaking it out. But obviously, I'll be the one. I'll still be the one explaining those to the public, and I'll be explaining them at the hearing, so you'll understand the background. The other thing we're doing, so I mean, it's so the other thing we're working on, and we're hoping to launch it in the next couple of days, is we are going to be um, putting a calculator uh, uh, page up on the web uh, website, and so people will be able to take their current, uh, you know, take their current most current quarterly bill, and you'll be able to put in two inputs from your current bill, mm -hmm. and it will show you exactly what you would pay under the new uh, both rate and fee system. Um, so that's, so we're working on that. <coughs> Again, so that people can individually take their bill and see how their last quarter consumption would affect them. Yes. And, and, then, and the low income exemption? For that's the, also going that's to be implemented as a, as a departmental, <coughs> you know, as a, as a departmental uh, initiative. Yeah. And the public hearing will be an opportunity to understand totally, the whole yes, package. Totally, yes. We'll be presenting this, you know, the, okay. we're presenting the new rate structure and everything as a whole, but the actual setting of the rates um, is, what, is what the council is being asked to do, the volumetric rates. Councilor Donald and Councilor uh, Adams and Councilor Labar. This might be one of the, the few fees that perhaps there is some logic in, in creating some kind of um, connection to a council endorsement, perhaps. You know, um, if you know the low income well, exemption be, is, is just the um, is the low because the low income exception is just the for for giving the fixed part of the fee. Right. So that's true. Yeah. Right. So I mean, since that is as Councilor Bidwell points out, that's a significant part of this, maybe maybe even not this year, but maybe in the future, um, a I guess I would say to you could I'm be a, arranged to figure out how the council could vote on that as well, since we are voting on the other part of the rate, somewhat lopsidedly, because you have taken w the very good step of, of reforming the water and sewer rates, but mm -hmm. it feels, feels incomplete to vote only on part of it. I think, I guess it would, I, gu I understand that, yeah. but if I'm if I'm also presenting to you what the total fees are in addition to the rates, mm -hmm. you can, if, if for example, the, the, f the fee part of it was over the top, then that might cause you to, your judgment about the rates might be impacted by that. So sure. Sort of a, a collab no, I, ta I take yeah. that point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Councilor Adams and Councilor Labar. <coughs> Uh, just on that last point, I find it hard to believe that the council found one to be reasonable. They vote against the other one. Um, but, 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 but I'll pass for now because uh, um, I have a bunch of questions. But I don't know. I don't know how how, how deep. How well, I, I thought we were referring tonight. Well, this is a referral. I'm asking, tonight. I, don't I, 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 want, I, I don't know how deep you want me to get into. Councilor Adams had asked me if if there would be any discussion on the referral, and I would. I said I wouldn't rule it out of order, but it, it depends how how granular you want to get on this, um, are they <coughs> be just as relevant in a, in a hearing? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, yeah, I mean. Okay. There's why, don't, why don't we save it for that? Okay. Council LaBarge, I would ask the same question of you. Yes. Um, I just have some questions for the mayor on this, please. Okay. <laughs> looking, uh, even though it's a referral, <coughs> looking at um, the tier ones and the tier twos and the customers with meters larger than um, one CCF and non meters. I mean, people are going to see this and say non meters and meters. Looking at this, it's, it looks like the new sewer rates are going to be proposed at 80%. Is that what it's looking at? That's exactly, yes. Right? 80% of water consumption. Water that is going to be charged 
Wait, right now we water that's now, coming out of your home. Right now correct? we charge, uh, and we're, this is turning into the hearing, but right I now know. we charge based but on. People 100%. are going to call us, Mayor, because they're yep. going to see this and ask questions. Yeah, and we're going to have we're going to have a lot of information to explain to them what, what what's happening, and at the hearing it'll be explained. And um, right, I think so we we had when when the consultants gave us a presentation, which we had a very long presentation yeah. and a PowerPoint presentation, no, no less. Um, and I think I'm, I have a feeling we're going to see that PowerPoint again, but, or some something similar. So I think that it's best, g given the fact this is a referral, and I think your questions are relevant, but I think in the course of the hearing it would be um, more productive to bring them up then, I think. So, uh, but trust that I'm, I, we're going to be putting out information that will really explain this to people. And, and you. you've conveyed to the mayor your interest in this particular issue, yep. and I'm sure that, that, that they'll address that. Um, okay, so as to the point of referral, the, the, the once again, it's referring to finance and the, <coughs> the public works committee. So, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right. Uh, we have a, this is second reading. This is the warrant on, for the upcoming election on March 1st, 2016, and I'll bet someone's going to ask me to be repeating. It's me. Yeah. <laughs> so, is there a motion to put that on the floor? <coughs> Just second. Second. Discussion? This is for the primary folks, if you're not registered for it, you're not registered for it. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, any discussion on this? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, that's all I got. Uh, that's fine. This, uh, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. No discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh. <coughs> Any opposed? Abstentions. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. When did, when did that <coughs>